Today's discussion is one of limitation and a look at the foundational points on the artistry of alchemy. Saying artistry might feel like an over-embellishment, but it's described as an art simply because it can be practiced. One person can display profound efficiency and talent, while another might fall by the wayside empty-handed and angry at the world. I might reasonably suspect that everyone here knows that alchemy is a mental game, a series of trials and tribulations resulting in an obscure goal or an unknown yet reinforced reward of all rewards. Yet hardly do we really bridge the gap beyond that point. To really get into it, we have to ask the question, why does alchemy even exist? In short historical context, alchemy is a representation of the many metaphors and allegories in the Hermetic philosophy, which is to say, Hermeticism. Not the Hermeticism we know in the modern minds, but its traditional styles and significance, akin to the Corpus Hermeticum or Divine Pymander. For an example of this relationship, one philosophical idea in Hermeticism is that like the microcosm and macrocosm. And in alchemy, it'll have beautified tapestries riddled with symbols and imagery, which is used to explain that belief and most of the time, other relevant points. In a sense, Hermeticism is the raw thought, the logic of the mind, while alchemy is the imagination, the pictorial representation being brought into relatable stories and archetypal symbols. So then you might say today's talk will be about Hermetic philosophy with a decor of alchemical symbolism. And you'd be right, as they aren't really separable. Specifically, we're going to talk about the worldview of the alchemical art as it relates to you, the practitioner. With all that being said, my name is River, and welcome to the Nemeton. To really understand the path we're traveling, we need to know to some degree our destination. For simple symbolism, we're pursuing that stone of the philosopher. In various lineages, we see people claim it is a real stone created by arcane admixtures and decoctions, pulling essence from one thing and combining it with another until we reach a tangible item that when held, eaten, or what have you, grants things like eternal life or infinite wealth. Yet I will say, as many before, that desire is a ludicrous one. To explain, almost all alchemical manuscripts ask of you, the learning individual, to give up your desires for wealth, to give up your egotistical inclinations, but then promises that if you do so, those desires for power and money will be met. Essentially, it's a trap. Not that there's nothing to be gained, but what is gained is not monetarily valuable in a direct sense, but an indirect one. The hermeticists and alchemists were seeking, as many others do, wisdom, or a connection to the divinity peering into the spaces beyond the physical, and rather look into the spiritual machinations. Or in the most occult circles, they literally sought to mutate the very nature of their soul, to take also of the tree of life and live forever. But let's ignore those metaphysical interests for now and focus on ourselves, as our ego knows nothing beyond itself. The initiatory works of alchemy are the arts of changing your psyche, how you think, what you think, essentially shifting yourself from one state and bridging to the next stage. There's no shortcuts or skips, but a formal process built out of observational philosophy. Essentially, people watching. And most importantly, paying attention to yourself, being aware of emotional states, situations, and your reactivity to those situations. In the hermetic mind, this process of change is entirely natural. Just like a child grows into an adult without their own agency, so too can the mind mature without its own agency. That's really the natural side of it. But nature also acts without resistance, surely succeeding, but taking all the time it needs to get there. Yet we human beings tend to lack the time so comfortably taken by nature. The alchemical portion is to expedite the process to patiently master self-change without getting hung up on the trials and tribulations. 
But we have a funny little detail in the alchemical sciences. You, me, and everyone else are entirely powerless. It isn't that you're hopeless, but you have no force aside from those within acting of their own predispositions. Let's look at this idea in a relevant text. You should understand that in their universal substance, nature herself fulfills all the operations in the matter spoken of, and not the operator. A line from Paracelsus. For example, we don't cause fire to burn, or even make fire. We simply create the environment in which objects combust and then burn. For another example, we don't make plants grow, or make their seeds, or cause their germination, but provide the formal conditions to support that occurrence. In a sense, you could say this is why ancient cultures claimed the human as the crown of creation. Like a delegating king, humanity built farms, sowed seeds, and nutrition burst forth from the ground. Or, he took braids of metal and watched as electrons went by their natural processes, containing it as it needed and directing it based on the electron's inclination, bursting forth into lights through a heated filament and glasswork. To clarify it further, the necessary reactions to make the light bulb operational pre-existed the actual invention of the bulb. It only required that the stage be set in the right way. This is at face value, the first observation of alchemical artistry. Let's take a brief look at a tract of anonymous authorship just to close it off. Does not nature obey an ingenious artist who knows her operations with her possibilities and attempts nothing beyond them? Surely this is true. Now, I know many viewers are interested in the magical aspects of most talks, so let's expand into it for a moment, even though it may seem distant. In old and traditional magical philosophy, works are performed by providing the right pieces to the right ends at the right time, etc. Which is to say, it is believed to be a given occurrence. Like, it will simply happen if done properly, in that proper setting. In the Solomonic and Goetic styles, the magician still has little to no power, but to ask assistance from some other form to act on his behalf, even then sometimes binding the entity by a name of divinity, because he, that magician, has no equivalent force by which to demand their compliance. To go even further, in the psychologically explained styles, the same is still true. Let's consider ceremonial practices. You set the stage, chant, or whatever, thereby causing mental shifts that aim towards a specific result. But you still had no power, so to say. You simply employed the processes of the mind. You used the implements and the normal inclinations of the psyche like a tool. We could say that the result wouldn't be achieved without the human participant, but the force was not wholly theirs. Only the will to commit was actually held in the palm of that hypothetical practitioner. It should be noted, though, the subconscious and conscious aspects both have natural inclinations and processes. However, and this is a really big distinction, the subconscious is considered the more literal, natural, or unblocked aspect of the mental scope. As in, it takes in everything, lashes out, acts without hindrance, is haphazard, but we as people mitigate it through our readily aware faculties. We hold it down, and honestly that isn't a bad thing, as nature can be rather gruesome. Let's move on. Since we know what we're trying to achieve in a way, and also what we can actually do to achieve it, we should discuss what the artistry aspect even is. We see in a brief guide to the Celestial Ruby, the whole process which we employ closely resembles that followed by nature in the bowels of the earth, except that it is much shorter. And that is actually the entirety of it. Not only is it to learn the process and be able to perform it, but its performance is meant to quicken, to shorten the time of change, 
or subdue with greater ability the various obstacles. It's a talent, and it's work. We should ask a blunt but serious question, though. If it's so easy to break down, why the obscurity? Why all the weird pictures or elaborate metaphors? One of the major reasons is that it was believed that the alchemical methodology of expression was the most fitting to illuminate or elevate the mind. It fostered forward thinking, philosophy, made room for mystical inquiry, and made the spiritual more material. It gave some earthiness to the intangible and the unreal. And that's actually the real beauty of the symbol of Mercury. It's an interesting metal, liquid in movement, but firm in rest. It goes smoothly and stands strong. Anyways, another reason for the obscurity is that early alchemical understandings lean their way into psychology. And psychological understanding is, while abusable, just look at all the wondrous people out there assuring control over yourself and others through psychological tips and tricks. Can you imagine if someone was actually adept at that? Making you want their goods to satisfy materialism, the real fool's gold, or swaying opinions so delicately. The thing is, is, you can reach various states of awareness. You can be qualified in a sense, and still be a bad apple. You can transmute, so to say, others into your spoiled mental scope. More minds. I mean, I know I'm being pretty dramatic, but if you really consider the effects of these things and how they've been witnessed in various groups, it's clear that tribal mentalities can achieve astoundingly good, but also bad things. It's the difference between philalathies and controlling cults. Plentiful possibilities in between. Surprisingly though, these mental hoops are the lower rung of the alchemical process. But it is also the biggest gatekeeper in this subject. Anyways, I hope this has helped you develop a bit of a foundation on the philosophy side of alchemy as it relates to you, and for anyone who waited the whole year for this one, I appreciate your patience. As always, a massive thank you to my friends, patrons, and supporters. I appreciate you more than you know.